Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. Reading in Jesus' name. And it came about, while he was on the way to Jerusalem, that he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a certain village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him. And they raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And it came about that as they were going, they were cleansed. Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found who turned back to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you create faith in us as we hear your word. For we read and believe that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. So we ask now that as we continue to meditate in your scripture and to hear, that it would be you that would speak to us, and that our hearts and our minds might be opened to hear, to receive, and to live in faith. We ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. I don't want to presume or assume anything, but I'm going to guess that the story of the healing of the lepers is a fairly familiar story. Uh, it comes up in different Gospels, and it comes up regularly as we're looking at the stories of Scripture. So I'm not actually going to talk about that story specifically, except that it, it acts for me kind of as a jumping off point to ask a question about how we live. We find in that particular event in the life of Jesus uh, that there were these lepers who cried out for mercy. We find that they were told to go to the priest to be examined. That was the proper way to go and uh, have confirmed that the leprosy had indeed been taken away. We find that a foreigner who would not have been welcome at the temple and among the priests, comes back to Jesus. And, and twice in the text, uh, we are given to, to see this man, that he is a foreigner, that he is a Samaritan. The Samaritans and the Jews did not particularly get along, not from the Samaritan side so much as from the Jewish side. We go all the way back in the history of the people of Israel, uh, to 712 BC, or, yeah, 712 BC, when the northern kingdom of Israel fell. The Assyrians replaced the, Jew, the, the Israelites that they took out of the land, brought in Assyrians and others, and then they intermarried. And so these people had intermarried with non-Jewish people. And so then after the Babylonian captivity, when the Jews returned from Babylon, they ostracized those people that had intermarried uh, and did not worship in Jerusalem. And so this man then, uh, I suppose, really represents us, uh, the foreigners, uh, the Gentiles. And then we see at the end of the conversation that Jesus has with him, he says, your faith has made you well. And while the occasion of that miracle is a physical one, I think there are also spiritual components that we can apply in our lives. And the question that, that comes for me is, so what is the rest of this man's story? Uh, 
If he was made well by faith in Jesus, does he then continue to live in faith in Jesus? And what does it look like for us to live by faith? And so I'm going to take us to the end of our Timothy reading, 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we're going to look at specifically at verses 11, 12, and 13. And, and this is possibly an, an ancient creed, maybe a poem. Uh, it's got a kind of a poetic element to it in terms of the lines that it's written in. One of the key elements of poetry is that it's written in lines as opposed to written in paragraph form. But we find here four statements. And I want us to look at these four statements that I think are an, both an encouragement and a warning to us about how we live out our life in faith. The first of those statements says, For if we died with him, we will also live with him. And this statement forms the foundation of our relationship with God, and then forms the foundation for how we live out our life in Him. We might say that we have a leprosy. We call it sin. And I think it's okay to take a historical event and look at it spiritually. Not that we want to make all of Scripture an allegory, but as we look at these ten lepers and the fact that they asked for mercy and the fact that Jesus affirms that they are healed by faith, that we can also then see that we have this condition called sin. And that the result of this condition is death. God told Adam and Eve in the garden that if they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would die. Now there wasn't some, you know, it wasn't a poisoned apple. But in eating of that tree, they broke trust with God. They declared to God that everything God had given to them wasn't enough for them. And the relationship was destroyed. And when they broke trust with God, when they sinned against Him by saying, we want to do things our own way. You haven't given us enough, so we're going to go outside of your boundaries. Now that's what a trespass is, right? We're crossing a boundary line where we don't belong. And so we, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we say, forgive us our trespasses, because we're crossing a boundary that God has set outside. We're going outside of God's boundaries. We sin. And then we become bound to sin, and the result for us is death. We die physically as a result of that, because our nature itself is broken. But we also die spiritually, and we are separated from God. So if we must die because we have sinned, then how can we both die and live? Because God doesn't want us to die. It is not God's choice that we be separated from Him by death eternal. So how can we die, which is the requirement of our sin, what we earn because of our sin, and still live? So what we find then is that Jesus invites us into His death, which He died in our place. God for whatever reason God chose to do it this way, and it's the way He chose to do it, He came to us, the Word who was God, became flesh and lived among us. And that Word, Jesus, went to the cross where He actually became our sin. So that He could die the death we deserve. And he died physically, but more importantly, he died spiritually. He died the death, that is, he was separated from the Father for us in our place. 
And I believe that when he cried out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's what was happening. That he was experiencing at that moment that separation in the very essence of who God is that is really beyond our understanding and even imagining. How, do, how can that be? That the very fabric of who God is is ripped apart because Jesus became our sin and was separated from the Father in our place so that we would not have to be separated from the Father through the forgiveness that he offers us in that event. So when we read in 1 John that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, but when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, the faithful and just has to do with the cross. Because he died our death, when we ask him to forgive us, he has to forgive us. He is faithful and he is just to forgive us when we confess our sin. And so what happens in that event then is that he invites us into participating in his death. We know for sure that that happens in baptism. We read in Romans chapter 6. Paul is actually talking about why we should not deliberately sin, boldly sin. He asks the question, should we continue in sin that grace may abound? That is, because God is gracious, shouldn't we just sin a lot so that he can show his grace? And his answer is absolutely not. Why not? Because we've died to sin. How did we die to sin? He asks it rhetorically, don't you know that when you were baptized, you were buried with Christ, you died with Christ, you were buried with Christ, and you were raised to new life, just as he was. Your old nature was put to death, and a new nature came to life. But we also believe that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, the word of Christ. So when we hear the word, we're also invited in. And that God puts to death the old nature as he gives us the gift of faith by his grace. That God puts to death the old nature as he invites us into his death. And the result of that is life. For if we died with him, because he invites us into his death, because he died our death, we will also live with him. And this is the wonderful promise that we have. That the result of his death is life for us. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So we, yes, we will die physically, unless we happen to be uh, the, the ones who are still living when Jesus returns. And so we will suffer the consequence of sin in that way. But even though we die, Jesus says, we will live as we participate in the death and resurrection of Jesus. We are given life. So we have that promise as a foundation. And then the rest of our life flows off of that promise. That having died with Christ, we live with Him. So then we are, because He is present in us, living in us, living through this life. And so we go to the second statement, which says that if we endure, we will also reign with Him. So this then is the living out of our lives. I don't think it's any secret that life can be hard. And that each one of us deals with hardships in our lives. Yes, there are times of joy and, and, 
I thank God that He gives us those, and yet we all know the struggles in life. There's illness. There's growing old, and the aches and pains of growing old as our bodies wear out. And there's death. And we all experience death, and I, I, this last week was exhausting for me. And, and I don't know, I, I have preached many, many funeral sermons and done many funerals, and for some reason, Pat's was particularly exhausting as death came among us. But because we've died with Christ, and because we have the promise of life, of His life in us now, and eternal life to look forward to, we endure. We stay firm. We hang on through the life that we have given. And we recognize that we are not walking through this life alone. You're probably familiar with the poem that uh, is what it's called Footprints. And the, the author uh, sees two sets of footprints and then just sees one. And then sees two, foot, two sets and questions God. I understand where there's two sets of footprints, but why did you leave me? And the reply that God gives is no, when there's only one set of footprints, it's because I carry it. I, I will be very honest with you, I don't like that poem. And here's why I don't like that poem. I don't want there ever to be two sets of footprints. I am not walking next to God. I want to be carried by Him all the time. There should only be one set of, foot, set of footprints, and they should be God's. As He carries us through this life. As His presence comforts and strengthens and gives us endurance. Because there is a promise of endurance, to endurance. That there is the reward of reigning with Him. Of living in His power and His authority in this world. And that when we live in the power and authority of Christ, then all of those things that we need to endure through become the vanquished. And we can have power over them in this life. So if we die with Him, we live with Him. If we endure, we reign with Him. But we also find that there is a warning here. And that we have to be careful that the difficulties of life don't turn us. That we have our focus firmly on Jesus, that we let Jesus carry us, because the warning says that if we deny Him, He also will deny us. And we need to take this warning seriously. The one option with the difficulties of life is that we allow Jesus to carry us through them and endure because of the faith that He gives us. The second option is what we're warned against here, that we deny Him. And unfortunately, we probably all have examples, or know people in our lives that instead of relying on the grace of God through the difficult times of life, have denied Him. Or we know of people who in the good times of life have become self-sufficient and self-important and self-righteous and have denied Him. So it can happen on both sides, I guess. Although the context here seems to be primarily the side of suffering, the side of needing to endure. If we listen to the devil, if we listen to the world, if we listen to our own sinful selves, our own fleshly desires, and end up denying Christ, then there are dire consequences. And we have to protect that. 
So when we hear the devil and pay attention to him and listen to him, you know, and that's what Adam and Eve did, right? And that is the pattern ever since. Because not he, he normally doesn't come openly. He comes with a half-truth. And makes it look like listening to him and following the world and following our sinful, na lustful natures will be good. What did he say to Adam and Eve? First he questioned God's word. Did God really say it? And then he said, oh, you're not really going to die. And there was a half-truth in that, right? They didn't fall over dead. They didn't eat a poisoned piece of fruit and drop dead. Although death did come immediately. Their spiritual death, their physical death didn't happen for another what, eight, eight, nine hundred years. But he does the same for us. He comes with a half-truth. That's really a lie. He questions God's word and suggests to us that there might be another way. Your own way. Your selfish way, your prideful way. And when we hear that and follow that, we deny Christ. We deny His Word working in us. We deny His presence. We deny His authority as we endure through the difficult times of life. And the warning is that He will in likewise deny us. It's like the parable uh, where the door to the wedding was closed and the guests, the last guests got there too late and they banged on the door and said, let us in, let us in. And the Lord said, I don't know you. Another way that we can speak of listening to the tempter in the world and our sinful flesh denying him is to call it faithlessness. We deny the faith. And so we have a final warning, but also that carries with it promise in the character of God. And he says to us, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. So that's another way to talk about denying. To live outside of faith. To not believe, to not trust, or to trust in ourselves. There's this thing in the, in the world around us, uh, you know, if, if only you believe, but there's no focus to that if only you believe. Believe in yourself, the power of positive thinking, No, if you want to do it, you can. Just work hard enough and it'll happen. And essentially that's a kind of faith, I suppose, but it's an empty faith because it's not in Jesus. So if we deny Him, if we listen to ourselves or the world around us, if we try to live like the world says we ought to live or can live, maybe not so much ought to, but can, although I think it's getting to be more and more either you accept the godless way or you will pay for it. In society, you'll lose your job, you'll lose your friends, you know, whatever's happening in the world around us. We are called to remain faithful, but if we deny it, it's faithlessness. But what we find here as we end this portion of scripture is that our faithlessness does not change the character of God. And so we come back to a promise. A promise on which we can rely. And a promise that can keep us faithful. Our faithlessness, our denying Christ, does not change his character. He remains faithful. 
Which means that then we can come back and understand and believe that His promises are true. It is outside of the character of God for God to deny Himself. It is within the character of God to remain true. And so then we come back again to 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, if we confess our denial, if we confess our faithlessness, if we confess that we would rather listen to the tempter, to the world, and to our sinful selves, confess that He is righteous and just. He cannot deny himself. He must, because he has promised us, forgive us. And so, even though the warning is there, we end with the promise. That there is a faithful God who forgives those who come to him penitently. There is a faithful God who gives life to those who die in Him. Gracious Lord Jesus, we thank You for Your love and Your mercy and Your grace. We thank You for Your Word, Your promise. We thank You for Your invitation into Your death and burial and resurrection. We thank You for the forgiveness of sins, for Your indwelling Spirit, for the promise of eternal life. We thank you for the victory we have over the struggles of this life, over temptation, over the voice of the tempter, over the voice of the world, over the voice of our lustful, sinful selves. We thank you that you are always faithful because that is your character. We can trust your faithfulness. We thank you, Jesus. We pray in your precious name.